Hi, I'm Scott Sturgill with the W Nutrient Pest Management Program, and I'm back again to discuss with you soil potassium. And this discussion is again part of the larger CCA pretest training uh, videos we're working on for this year. Potassium, as you know, is the third of the big three nutrients that we're concerned about. Uh, we have nitrogen, N, uh, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. Uh, just like phosphorus, soils contain large amounts of potassium. However, uh, most of that potassium is fixed or held by soil particles, particularly clay particles, and unavailable to plants. Thus, we need to supplement uh, soils for crop production with potassium, uh, more so than we do with phosphorus. Uh, because large amounts of potassium are removed with the crops commonly grown in Wisconsin. Um, alfalfa, corn silage, other forage legumes all remove a great deal of potassium uh, from the soil. Sands and organic soils tend to lose uh, soil, excuse me, use, lose potassium from the soil profile and typically test low for plant available K. Uh, we'll talk about some unique management considerations for our sands and organic soils. They just don't hold on to potassium very well. And intuitively obvious, if we don't uh, apply potassium, we will draw down soil test K levels. And these soil test K levels can draw down much more quickly than the drawdown we talked about with soil phosphorus levels. And we'll have a graphic or two that'll look at that in a moment. This is the potassium cycle, and we will look at inputs of potassium to the soil and exports of potassium from the soil. By far the most important input of potassium uh, to the soil is the parent material of the soil. Uh, minerals, bedrocks, as they weather, they release potassium and, and other nutrients. Um, fertilizer is a for an input. Manure, biosolids, uh, all important inputs to uh, potassium in the soil profile. Uh, losses of potassium uh, from the soil cycle or uh, the potassium cycle. Crop removal, potential loss of potassium if we're losing any of the fertile to topsoil through erosion or runoff. Uh, just like phosphorus, potassium is taken up by the plant in the dissolved or soluble form. Um, this uh, soluble levels of soil test potassium are, are relatively low uh, relative to overall uh, concentrations of potassium in the soil profile. Uh, and we'll talk about a minute about how potassium is released from the soil and available for crops. Again, the parent materials, bedrock, minerals such as mica, feldspars, uh, over time and very slowly release potassium. Um, some of this potassium are, is fixed or held by clay particles. Um, this is what we call the non-available potassium. It gets trapped uh, as, it, as the parent material weathers. It gets trapped in the clay layers. You remember our clays are made up of layers of molecules. We have one-to-one -one clays and two-to-one expanding clays. Well, potassium is strongly held by these clays. If it gets in the clay layers, uh, between layers of clay, it's strongly held and hard uh, to be released for plant uptake. Over time, some of this potassium is released. Um, we have what we like to call the non-exchangeable potassium and the exchangeable potassium. Potassium that uh, is in equilibrium with the soil solution is the exchangeable potassium. Here, uh, soluble potassium is either um, taken up by the plant or can be immobilized by the soil itself. Specifically, when I say immobilized, it can be bound to clay particles. This uh, potassium is exchangeable or available to come into solution and be available to plants because this potassium is held on the outside of clay particles rather than inside clay particles. Think about cation exchange capacity. Cation exchange capacity is the ability of soil particles, organic matter particles, to hold on to uh, cations. And uh, this is what's going on here with the exchangeable potassium. So there's an equilibrium here between uh, plant available or dissolved potassium in the soil solution with the exchangeable potassium which is held on the exchange sites of certain clay minerals and other soil particles. Uh, and this equilibrium is also going this way in terms of the fixed or unavailable or very slowly available potassium uh, from uh, the soil itself. Uh, 
Again, the release of potassium from parent material to fixed clays to available clays is very slow, and we can't rely on that to supply potassium at levels to meet the agronomic needs or the nutritional needs of the crops we intend to grow. One other uh, loss that I didn't mention of potassium from the soil can be through leaching. Fortunately, we don't worry about leaching or losing potassium, uh, or when we do lo lose it, we don't worry about it from any environmental standpoints. However, on our sands, which have very low cation exchange capacity, we tend to lose potassium as, as water moves potassium uh, ions through the soil profile. Also, we tend to leach uh, potassium or lose potassium on our organic soils. Now, we know organic soil particles have a very high cation exchange capacity, but even though organic matter has a high cation exchange capacity, it does not hang on to potassium uh, cations uh, very strongly, so we can lose potassium through, through leaching, again, on our sandy soils and our organic soils. Uh, to explain a little better uh, what I talked about in that diagram, the pools of potassium in the soil profile, the unavailable uh, potassium is contained in the soil and some clay minerals, that's this here. The slowly available potassium is held by other clay minerals, and this is the storehouse of potassium uh, over time. Uh, this is where the potassium is released over time, Oop, going the wrong way, and this is the available or exchangeable potassium associated with other species or other types of clay that are, are, are more available. Again, low amounts of uh, clay uh, on our sandy soils, thus low amounts of, of potassium on our sandy soils or movement out of the soil profile on our sandy soils. And for organic uh, soils, they don't hold on to potassium very well. The readily available potassium, that is the potassium that's in the soil solution is available uh, for uptake uh, by the crops. This is one last graphical representation of how soil potassium interacts with the soil clay particles. Again, remember clay particles are layers of minerals that uh, are forming a clay particle. Those layers that are on the outside on the cation exchange sites are readily available to come into solution and can be utilized by plants. The non-exchangeable or slowly released uh, buffer, if you will, potassium, is that that's contained uh, within the clay particles. Soil tests measure the amount of exchangeable potassium, or we estimate through our extractants the amount of exchangeable potassium as well as the potassium that's dissolved and readily available in the soil solution. Factors that influence this exchangeable or readily available potassium uh, in our soils are wetting and drying cycles, freezing and thawing, thawing cycles, and oxidation state or the, the content and state of iron in our, soil profile, in, our, in our soils, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Wetting and drying, exchangeable potassium can, content can increase or de decrease when the soil is dried, and that depends on the type of clay minerals that are present. Um, some minerals, when they dry, the layers will collapse around any anions, in this case cations, um, excuse me, cations that are uh, contained within the layers of the soil profile, and it will hang on to them. Other types of clays, when they are dry, the layers will open up, and the potassium can be released from these types of clays and out into the soil solution. So. Uh, Time of sampling, if we do soil sampling, relative to soil wetness uh, can influence soil test K levels. And you're going to hear me say this a couple of other times. Um, if When we're sampling fields uh, for routine soil testing, it's important that we try to sample at the same time of the year, more or less, um, whenever we're sampling, whether it's once every four years, once in the rotation, or, or more frequently than that, because soil test potassium levels can change uh, as a function of temperature, as a function of soil wetness. So we'd like to make uh, as close as we can get to apples to apples comparison. So if you're soil sampling in the fall in one year, try to soil sample in the fall the next time you're soil sampling a given field. Likewise with soil moisture, freezing and thawing or soil temperatures can impact the amount of potassium that's relieved by soils. Uh, this all depends on uh, clay mineralogy and, and uh, other factors in the soil. Uh, soils that contain considerable amount of micas, they can release potassium as a function of freeze-thaw cycles. Again, this influences the, um, 
the layering, the strength of the layers that are holding the soil potassium in the soil. Um, other soil types that have smaller amounts of mica and greater amounts of exchangeable potassium, they're not so affected by freeze-thaw cycles. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you know, uh, the time of soil sampling uh, influences nutrient levels for potassium. So um, we can see differences due to moisture content, due to, f due to temperatures in spring versus fall sampling, uh, depending on the clay minerals that are present. So again, with uh, repeated soil sampling of a given field, it's important that you sample the field at the same time of the year from sampling cycle to sampling cycle. The mineralogy, or the content of the clay, specifically the iron content of the clay, also has some influence on the um, potassium content and the potassium release from soils. Uh, this is a rough diagram that a soil scientist at UW-Madison prepared looking at uh, general generalizations of uh, clay mineralogy across the state of Wisconsin, and you can see our clay soils different, different uh, have different properties across the state depending on where they're found and one of these properties is iron, uh, iron content and iron oxidation state and these all influence potassium availability as well. Okay, the soil test. When we stick a soil probe in the ground, we collect a soil sample, we send it off to the lab. What is the lab measuring? The, le me me the lab is measuring um, two parameters re regarding uh, soil test potassium. Uh, they're measuring the potassium that's in the soil solution. This is the dissolved, readily available uh, solution. And it's also, est also estimating the exchangeable potassium. How much of that potassium that's on those uh, clay particles, those soil particles, and to some extent the organic matter particles is available to come into solution and be available to plants. Um, last time I'm going to say this, and I, you, you see it here again, uh, when you're sampling uh, for potassium, which is part of routine soil sampling, it's important that you sample the same time from, from year to year because there can be seasonal vari variation in the soil test potassium levels we're going to find. What are the optimum soil test potassium levels uh, for the major crops grown in Wisconsin? They're illustrated here. On our loamy, which are our medium and fine textured soils, you'll see the optimum ranges for alfalfa, corn, and soybean. They range from 100 to 140 parts per million soil test potassium. Our non-responsive levels uh, for alfalfa are greater than 240 parts per million potassium, 190 for corn and for soybeans. Uh, here's an example of what the potassium recommendations are for alpha, alfalfa. I showed you a similar table for uh, phosphorus recommendations for corn. You can see that the amount of potassium we need to apply is a function of the soil test level. The higher the soil test level for potassium, the less fertilizer we need to apply. The higher the yield goal for the given crop, be it alfalfa, be it corn, the more potassium we're going to have to apply. Again, these recommendations can be found in detail in UW Extension Publication A2809, our soil test recommendation publication. Environmental factors that affect potassium availability to plants, uh, soil moisture influences that. When we are going through uh, dry soil conditions, we have little or low soil moisture. Uh, there is less diffusion of soluble potassium to the roots. Um, diffusion is the major uh, form of uptake of potassium into plants, so dry soil conditions lead to uh, reduced potassium uptake. Uh, if we increase soil moisture, uh, from 10% to 28%, for example, you can see an increase in potassium transport in the soil solution to the roots by up to 175%. Now, too much moisture, on the other hand, can result in restricted root growth, low oxygen, and slow potassium absorption by the roots. So, uh, you know, saturated soils, cold soils are something that's going to inhibit potassium uptake by plants. I already mentioned the impact of soil temperature. Here's a, a slide that just uh, reiterates what I said. You know, low soil temperatures will restrict plant growth, root growth, and the uptake of potassium. Uh, if we have uh, high potassium levels in the soil, it will increase potassium uptake at these low soil temperatures. So this is one of the reasons we see positive responses to starter fertilizer or banded fertilizer. Um, you know, the, the plant roots are slowly expanding. If they can get to that band of concentrated uh, phosphorus and potassium, uh, the plant will respond positively.
Soil pH, uh, we want to keep our pH in optimum levels for crop production. Uh, at low pH or acidic soils, the potassium has more competition for cation exchange sites, thus less of it's available and held by the soil. When soils are limed, um, greater amount of potassium can be held on the cation exchange uh, sites and uh, excuse me, potassium leaching will be reduced. As I mentioned earlier, when you're talking about the potassium cycle, potassium leaching can occur on our coarse textured sandy soils and our mucky soils, particularly our organic soils if they're irrigated. Uh, large fall applications of potassium to sandy soils or organic soils are discouraged. Uh, it's not a good idea to apply these in the fall just like nitrogen because chances are we're going to leach or move that potassium through the soil, pro soil profile and out of the root zone and it won't be there in the spring uh, when the crops need it. Particularly on our sandy soils and our organic soils, annual maintenance of or manual applications of potassium is important. We need to monitor our soil test phosphorus, excuse me, soil test potassium levels a little more closely and perhaps a little more often on our sandy and organic soils uh, regarding potassium on these soils. I'd like to talk a little bit about some potassium management cons uh, considerations that we have to worry about in Wisconsin. Many of our soils are potassium deficient and this trend is getting worse in the state of Wisconsin. You'll see some data in just a few minutes looking at the decrease in average soil test potassium levels over time in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this is due to a couple of concerns. The most important is probably economics and I'll elaborate later, but also any fields where we have alfalfa or corn silage in the rotation are prone to utilizing a lot of soil potassium and these fields should be monitored closely to make sure we don't drop our soil potassium levels below optimum ranges for crop production. Uh, potassium should be monitored in reduced or conservation tillage systems. Uh, switching to these systems can cause some co soil compaction. Soil compaction and other factors can lead to um, a lower availability of potassium in the soil, so we need to keep a handle on it there. Uh, top dressing is important to our forage needs, our alfalfa and other forage legumes. Uh, applying supplemental potassium during the growing season, typically after the first and third cutting, to uh, optimize our alfalfa yields and to uh, maintain forage quality are important. One other concern too, we do have to be a little bit aware of excessive levels of potassium in our soils, translating to ex excessive levels of potassium in our forages. If we have such a situation, um, folks that work in the dairy nutrition side are, are keenly aware of the problems that excess potassium in the diet can cause, things like milk fever and other concerns with cattle. So if we're dealing with excessively high uh, soils, soil test potassium, we likely are going to have high levels of potassium in the forages we're harvesting and uh, we'll need to be aware of that when we're looking at the diet we're feeding to our dairy cattle in Wisconsin. This is a chart similar to the phosphorus chart you looked at which shows the average soil test potassium levels in Wisconsin over a 50-year period from the mid-60s to uh, uh, 2009. The, the bar um, you can see a steady increase, but this is what I'm worried about here, which I talked about in the previous slide, the decrease we're, we're seeing in uh, soil test potassium levels in the last couple of sampling periods. Uh, when I showed this diagram for phosphorus, we had this bar here going across, which was the excessively high range for uh, most of our crops, our commonly grown crops in Wisconsin. Well, with potassium, this isn't our excessively high range. This is our optimum range, and you can see Potassium levels are, you know, in that optimum range, but certainly aren't ex excessively high as we see in the soil test phosphorus category. And again, we're worried about this decline in soil test potassium values. Uh, the rise and the buildup of soil test potassium levels uh, in terms of county averages across the state, county average soil test pa uh, potassium levels are illustrated here in this graphic showing data from 1974 to 2009. Uh, you'll see the darker the red is where we want to be with soil test potassium levels in the range uh, about optimum for, for crop uh, production in the state of Wisconsin. You can see in general a buildup in soil test P uh, across the 70s through the 80s uh, into the 90s. Once we get into this period, the latter part of the 90s and the early 2000s, you'll see a, a paling or a, a pinking, if you will, 
of this map showing general declines in soil test potassium levels. And this uh, is not a good sign. We don't like to see it, but there are some valid reasons for it. Uh, those of you that were out there in the industry uh, in the latter part of the last decade, remember what happened to uh, energy prices, gas prices, and fertilizers in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, all those commodities went up, energy-related commodities, and so did the cost of fertilizer. Uh, potassium fertilizers really spiked, in some cases doubled or beyond what their previous prices were. Uh, as a result, K applications were, were limited on farms because of the, the lack of affordability of potassium. Um, we're growing more corn silage today than in the past with the expansion of the uh, dairy industry in the state of Wisconsin. More uh, corn is being har harvested for silage than, than in the past and when we harvest corn silage we're removing significantly more potassium than we would if we were just harvesting corn grain. Um, there's also a concept I've heard a few people talk about out there is that uh, folks feel that since potassium is derived from soil bedrock, soil minerals, soil clay, that the soil will re replenish itself in time, that the subsoil can supply potassium. And it can, but it can't supply enough to a crop to give us an agronomic or a profitable yield. So in terms of growing agronomic crops, the soil potassium will not replenish itself or will not replenish itself uh, enough to allow us to re, uh, achieve our optimum yields for, for crop production. Uh, re, if you saw the soil uh, phosphorus discussion that I talked about, um, how long it takes to build up soil test phosphorus levels and how long it takes to draw them down, the, uh, the story is just the opposite with potassium. We talked about a buffering capacity. Buffering capacity is a soil property and it's the amount of fertilizer that's required to change a soil test uh, value by one parts per million. Uh, for phosphorus, we needed to apply 18 pounds of P2O5 to result in a one part per million change in, in soil test phosphorus. For potassium, we're, the buffering capacity is significantly lower. Only six to seven pounds of K2O will result in a one part per million change in soil test P. Therefore, significantly less time is required to lower or raise soil test K levels compared to phosphorus. Also, the demand of our crops, particularly our forage legumes and corn silage, are greater for potassium than they are for phosphorus. So we're going to draw down uh, potassium levels quicker in the rotation than we are in phosphorus. This is that same example we did for phosphorus, only this time we're substituting potassium. Let's say we start out at the beginning of this two years corn, one year oat, three year hay rotation with an excessively high level of soil test potassium at 200 parts per million. If we don't any, apply any supplemental potassium, we look at uh, crop removal of the rotation, we look at the change in soil test P by subtracting that removal of K2O, subtracted by the buffering capacity, uh, results in 145 part per, million, uh, part per million potassium change. So 200 minus that 145 part per million gives us a 55 parts per million soil test potassium value after the six year rotation. So unlike phosphorus, excuse me, we went from excessively high and stayed at excessively high after the six year rotation. With potassium, we started at excessively high and after six years of this rotation and no supplemental potassium, uh, we drew our soil test levels down to the very low category. So soil test potassium levels change very quickly. Soil test phosphorus levels change very slowly. And again, here we're looking at crop removal of various crops grown in the state of Wisconsin. And you can see relative to potassium, the large uh, removal rates are associated with alfalfa and corn silage. You can see the degrees here of potassium removal relative to corn grain, soybean, and wheat. Potassium deficiency. We'll wrap up here with our discussion of potassium deficiency on how to use your, your eyes uh, as a diagnostic tool for identifying potassium deficiency. Potas potassium deficiency is a pretty easy deficiency to uh, identify out in the field and um, if you're going to be a CCA worth worth your salt, you know, you're going to have to be able to identify this right away. Uh, the classic potassium deficiency symptoms in corn 
are a yellowing or a chlorosis of the leaf margins starting at the tip and going down the leaf margins and beginning at the um, older plants the uh, the bottom plants of, of, a, of a corn plant uh, potassium is a mobile nutrient in the plant meaning that when the plant is stressed for potassium it will feed off the older leaves and shoot the potassium uh, to the new growth so your if your crops are deficient in potassium you're going to see it on the older the lower uh, leaves again here's a transgression of a healthy corn plant one that's starting to uh, get a little low in terms of soil test potassium you'll see the yellowing along the margins starting at the tip and worsening conditions as we lower our soil test potassium levels with alfalfa we have to be keenly aware of uh, potassium deficiencies in alfalfa and the symptoms there are pretty telltale there you'll see the white or yellow in some cases brown spots on alfalfa leaves starting at the tip and working down the margin you don't see bands or streaks like we see in corn you see these spots uh, don't confuse this with hopper burn hopper burn is broad bleached areas along the margin of the plants the spots are telltale signs of potassium deficiency in alfalfa and here's another shot of what it looks like in alfalfa potassium same bit uh, chlorosis yellowing browning of the leaves the older leaves first uh, starting at the tip and progressing down the margin of the soybean plant and here is another photograph of uh, potassium deficient soybeans in the field you'll notice the chlorosis starting at the tip going down the leaf margins and the older or lower leaves uh, are being affected by the potassium deficiency prior to the new leaves on the plant. So with that, that wraps up my discussion of potassium in soils. I thank you very much for your time and attention.